And after the talk, uh, we will um, also do um, a Q&A session. Um, yeah, let's start it. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, oh, hi. There's a lot more people here than I expected for a, a talk that wasn't scheduled 24 hours ago. Uh, so this is the emergency backup talk for uh, CCC. Um, see? Uh, and it's a, bit, it's a bit rough. I was actually still writing it um, on this stage five minutes ago. Uh, so there's, there's some slides that I really wanted to have in here that aren't because I couldn't find the file to cut and paste the stuff from. So I'll just describe it in words. Um, but it's, this is basically a, a bunch of bits and pieces of some other uh, research I did. And uh, so at least that part was done. Uh, I, I always say, oh, I'll, I'll, next year I'll, I'll have my, my talk done by the, by the time I'm due to give it on stage. But I don't know. So, um, all right, so, so, okay, so everybody here's heard of Dooku, right? Because I don't want to explain it. Okay, good. So, um, anyway, so there was this, uh, it was the son of Stuxnet or something, and, uh, uh, and this talk is not, not about that. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the initial like like keylogger thing uh, that was used in the uh, the attack was originally sent to the victims in an office document that was emailed to them, uh, and it, it was uh, an embedded font that um, was uh, was an exploit for a uh, an O-Day in the Windows kernel, um, and so the this was discovered around, or at least it was publicly reported around the end of last year. Uh, cri crisis did, uh, apparently just was the original discoverers and then Symantec and Kaspersky did a whole ton of press releases about it and, um, uh, and so forth. And uh, uh, Kaspersky actually went, and, uh, went back and actually found some examples of the attack as far back as 2010. Uh, so I, I, uh, I don't know how long, how old the, uh, this exploit's been around for, but it was apparently being actively used at least two years ago. Or at least for at least for a year before it was discovered, um, and then uh, three months ago, uh, this particular exploit was in the news again because uh, a number of Russian exploit kits have started using it. Uh, originally, the Cool exploit kit uh, was, um, and then and then followed up with Black Hole, except it's really hard to tell because the Cool exploit kit and the Black Hole exploit kit are almost identical. And they might actually be the same thing. There's still some debate. Uh, it's basically, the admin panel is different. But otherwise, everything else on the exploit kits is identical. So I don't know what's up with that. And uh, so last night, while I was like doing, I was googling on this. I I, I discovered, I noticed um, a bunch of reports from back in June that uh, make sense now in context. Uh, there was there was a. Um, um, one of the, there was a black hole exploit kit that actually had a, like some early alpha version uh, with this particular font exploit on it. It was named test test or whatever, and it didn't work. And so nobody, nobody really figured out what it was. Uh, but, but looking at it, looking at the current exploit in the, in the kit and looking at the, uh, um, the prototype back in June, it's clearly direct code lineage. So, um, so there were so uh, most of the slides I wanted to stick in here were going to be up at the front, so um, because that's other background on the stuff. But it, uh, the the um, the only difference there is really wasn't well. So basically, the only difference between the uh, the version of the exploit that was being used by Black Hole and Cool and stuff like that, and uh, the one that was used in the Dooku attack. Um, was the uh, basically the shellcode was different. Otherwise, it is nearly a bit for bit identical. Um, like even the metadata is still the same. Like the uh, the the copyright on the font is still the same. The the last timestamp for the modif metadata modification is all the same. Uh, the number of CVT entries is the same, and so forth. There's, the, the big difference is that it was uh, compressed into an embedded open type font, so you could basically drop it into a web page. Uh, and so there was like some sl uh, slight changes that, uh, some slight transformations that happen when you go from a true type font to, a, to an open type font. But uh, uh, as far as I could tell, there was, there was basically uh, 
no changes other than the shell code and two bytes of the font program were nulled out. Uh, I'm not entirely certain why that is yet, but it doesn't seem to affect performance. Um, the, uh, so the, the shell code in the original Dooku exploit um, would uh, sleep for about 10 minutes and then install a kernel device driver that was embedded in the font. Uh, which was like a, a rootkit keylogger thing. I haven't actually uh, s examined that part. Uh, the the shellcode that's in the exploit kit versions uh, downloads an executable file off of the, the site, drops on the disk, and runs it. Um, so, so here's the technical part. Well, here's a bit of, a bit more background. So, so. Uh, um, so the, for some reason, <laughs> Windows uh, parses, uh, actually draw, does the graphics drawing for, for fonts inside of kernel memory, not in user space. And uh, it, it, seemed, it seemed a bit, a bit mystifying <laughs> at first, but I, I, I made a discovery last night. I was, I was like looking at, I was poking around on, uh, well, Google or something, I can't remember. And on uh, the MSDN TechNet on uh, Microsoft's website, they actually have a, 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 a document they wrote back when they made this change explaining the rationale for it. And this has got some hilarious quotes in it here. So <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> so it's, this is the actual URL to it if you want to go read the full thing. Um, anyway, it's, it's basically, it, it goes to great lengths to argue that there's no security problems that are introduced by moving all of the font rendering code up into the kernel. <laughs> um, it's like, uh, yeah, the kernel mode implementations of Win32 are fully protected from direct access by applications. Right. And, uh, oh, oh yeah, and so the, you know, processes can't write the memory locations occupied by kernel code. Right? <laughs> anyway, so, so consequently, there's no change in stability or reliability. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, there's even more. Hang on a second. Um, the, uh, oh, yeah, so they go into like this, this whole marketing thing about how, how they're so much better than OS2 warp. Um, and then, uh, um, and that basically, you know, other operating systems like Warp, uh, you know, are, are not high-end platforms like Windows NT is. They're just medium-range ones, so they can actually, like, they're okay with, like, crashing on a bad font or something. Um, and and th this, is the great, this is the best part. This is my favorite part. Uh, on, the, on the section on security, it, it says that um, uh, essentially making this change won't have any effect on the uh, DoD uh, C2 and E3 uh, certification on, on Windows. If you remember like 10 years ago, that was a big deal that Windows had been ooh, C2 certified, which basically means that, that you glue the floppy drive shut and don't have a network card. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Microsoft hyped it up like crazy because they, they were using, trying to sell a bunch of stuff to like government agencies. Um, so, so yeah, so apparently, uh, Apparently, this doesn't, you know, break the certification somehow. Anyway, so, um, all right, so, so true type fonts, they're actually little programs. So here's a bit of background uh, or on fonts. Here's the history of fonts. So the earth cools. Uh, and then everybody starts using bitmap fonts. Uh, and then and Adobe, uh, they come with PostScript. Um, and they, they actually do proper typesetting and stuff like that, so you can actually have proportional spacing and, and stuff like that. And they, they, uh, that's where all the PostScript type 1 fonts are. Uh, and they're all done using cubic Bezier curves. Um, then true type fonts were basically uh, created because um, Adobe had a patent on cubic Bezier curves and nobody wanted to pay the license on it. So, uh, so true type uses quadratic curves. Uh, and then OpenType is kind of similar, but with some, some more features. So, um, the, uh, so there's an actual virtual machine uh, that interprets the TrueType font 
uh, and essentially performs a series of a, a bunch of graphics operator, operations to, to basically draw the outline of a character. If you want to draw a letter D, you go, you go, you say these are the dots and connect them like this, and do, 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 do. And, you, and, then, and then you've got a letter D drawn. Then it, then it rasterizes it, so it, you can scale it to whatever size and so forth. It's, you sh should all know this. Um, so the actual uh, file format's actually pretty simple. It's, it's one of those uh, file formats where there's basically like a table of like offsets and links and checksums in the beginning, uh, and then basically just a giant chunks of structures just stacked one on top of each other. Uh, it was originally, I think it was uh, originally developed for the Mac or something, so it's in um, a big engine byte order. Uh, anyway, it looks like this. Um, anyway, the, uh, you don't have to care about any of this stuff at the beginning. It's, it's for doing a, a, well actually, this is the magic number. There's actually like several possible values for it. Uh, cause, because Apple did one thing and then Microsoft did another thing and then Microsoft did yet another thing and, and, so, and so forth. Um, the, uh, this is for doing some sort of binary search tree thing if you can't fit an entire font into your 128K Mac. Um, I don't think it's really used much anymore, I think, but I don't know. It's, it's not, not really the interesting part. So um, there's basically 16 tables in this font here. Um, and uh, each one is 16 bytes long. So uh, each, each one starts with a little tag. This one's the embedded bitmap data tag, which has that magic number. Um, it's got a checksum, which is literally just all the bytes added together, mo uh, divided by, uh, you know, uh, 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 truncated as a 32 bit boundary. Um, and this is where it starts in the file, and that's how big it is. Anyway, uh, next one, same thing, and so forth. Um, so in this particular font, the font program, which is this particular table entry, uh, starts over here. Um, at, you know, uh, anyway. So uh, the font, font program, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fourth uh, style language. It's a, it's a, a push down stack autonoma. Uh, if you're familiar with PostScript all, it's basically like PostScript, but with less stuff. Um, and so most of the opcodes are about one byte long, and they'll take like a one or two byte argument. Uh, so in this particular case, this font program starts here. Uh, the first instruction is a push. Um, and there's, an, there's an immediate value. It pushes a D word. So that's what the W stands for. Uh, in this particular case, it, it pushes this number for some reason. Uh, I haven't actually figured out why, actually, because it, it doesn't, uh, this just seems to be like kind of a, this program just seems to be here so that, so that there's something here that does nothing. Uh, it's sort of a no-op, but uh, um, it, it, need, it has to be there for the, for the exploit to work. I'll explain later. Uh, so anyway, it pushes, pushes some more bytes, and it multiplies them together, uh, and then it pushes down, it pushes another D, uh, another D word on, and then it uh, adds them together, and then, in, and then it uh, sticks another 12, uh, another value on the stack, this, this time it's 12, uh, and then it adds that, and then it jumps to that address, which goes way off into the end of the program, which basically uh, for a true type font means uh, stop running. It, uh, it, the, the program terminates when it hits the end of its, of its little mem defined memory space. Uh, there's no explicit halt instruction, so. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so there was actually a whole like hundred slides in here on like how to analyze this that I that I cut out because uh, some some of it I can't really I don't know if I can actually talk about um, but um, uh, but, but all this stuff uh, this stuff more or less applies to the to the uh, uh, exploit kit stuff too so the uh, Anyway, so this, this, there's this glyph program. This is, so when the crash happened, uh, it was in the middle of this particular call function call right here. If you go into like uh, K, KD and look at the do analyze or whatever, it'll, it'll say, oh, this is the last function on the, uh, that was called. Um, and so something in here, whatever, so basically this is the, some that, or rather something in this function eventually led to executing shellcode. Uh, and, the, and the last thing this thing was, 
looking at the, its, its arguments for basically this font program here. So um, it, it's pretty easy to read. It's, this is the, the length. Um, it's you know another thing. It, it pushes pushes some more zeros on. It stores them in, uh, in an array. Uh, it flips a bit for um, whether or not to mirror uh, your images around the x-axis. Um, you know, sticks another zero on the stack, and so on and so on and so forth. And I'll explain what that all means later, because that's the important part. Actually, this this is the important part of the exploit. So, um, so if you're you're in a kernel debugger, it looks like this. Um, the uh, this is the the uh, stack. These are the stack frames that are still intact, at least at the time the the system blue screens. Uh, so so the um, the the uh, the particular font that I'm I'm uh, using to induce this blue screen of, of death crash uh, has the shell code replaced with a uh, call instruction that calls back to itself. So it just fills up the stack and then crashes uh, when it hits the end of that stack frame uh, or that, that page. So, uh, so pretty much this is the, uh, these are the uh, functions of uh, return addresses, so on and so forth. That's the first argument, second argument, so forth. Um, if you take a look at it, yep, that's that's the font program we're just looking at, indeed. Um, yeah, that's that's it. So the second argument points to the end. These are the flags, um, which is, you know, that many bytes, you know, plus it's pretty much that value plus the length of the thing. So it's basically pointing at the end. Um, anyway, which is kind of right there. The Oh, here's a remind. Yeah, this is what I just said. So, yeah, the, the, the weird thing about this though is this, these this, this flag fields. It's the um, in the uh, in this particular table. There's a there's another four bytes at the end for um, some flag settings that aren't actually used by this at all. Uh, and so it's it's curious that that whoever wrote this created this font uh, set the value of these flags to uh, three one three seven in hexadecimal, because uh, it doesn't actually make any sense interpreted as flags. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what could this possibly mean? Um, <laughs> anyway, it, interpreted as flags, it, it, that's what it means, which doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, it also doesn't quite make sense, because <laughs> uh, yeah. when you first look at it, you think, well, that would be like 31337. No, wait, that doesn't work because of the backwards. So I, I don't know what's up with that. If anybody has any ideas. Somebody confused from the is. Yeah. <laughs> so that may very well be the reason, actually. Uh, the, the comment was somebody got confused by the endedness. Um, so anyway, so anyway, there's the there's the last there's the return address. Um, so uh, if you go and look at it, it's uh, trying to move, or rather, the, the, well, rather there's the call to the function that where the shell would happen, and then, then a fault happened. It never actually made it to that address. It was supposed to return there, but it never actually did. Um, so um, so somewhere down this path goes to shell code. Anyway. Um, there, was a, there was a whole sort of narrative story that went along with these slides of like, here's how you would analyze a kernel exploit if you suddenly have to analyze a kernel exploit like this. Um, but uh, I'm just sort of skimming over it because I, I, I just, and just kind of give, uh, giving you the important stuff. So they, there's this other argument also that um, was, um, whatever the, the current offset it was for, oh no, this, this, this goes to the global VM state structure. So I'll, I'll go, go into this in a moment. Uh, it, it's very obvious, it stores, the, whatever this thing is, it points to a bunch of more pointers. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then EDI is of course the index, uh, is apparently the, uh, it, it's pointing to the, almost to the last instruction, but not quite. Uh, so it was, it was the index counter, I'm pretty sure, for like which, what the current instruction is while walk, walking down this thing. Uh, and so the, the funny thing is that the last instruction it, uh, that was executed, therefore, must have been this uh, uh, stores, some storage word or something. 
No, uh, or whatever it was. It was an LSW in the actual documentation for true type fonts that I'll explain later. Um, there's a slide for that. So, um, so the last instruction it called was that, and then it crashed. Uh, and so it never actually got to, ins to execute any of these. And this is significant. Uh, and I'll exp explain this mystery in a moment as well. So, uh, oh yeah, and so the, the stack overflow, it was, that's the stack. You see it's full of zeros, it's got a bunch of zeros at the end because it, it got overflowed. Uh, that was what the actual blue screen was. Um, and the other thing was like, uh, if you're like trying to figure out how to like, like get from here to like this pointer that points to the shell code, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a distance, you can figure out the, like, say the difference between each of the registers and like where this, this particular pointer to the shell code is. Uh, it's, uh, in this particular case, it's like, um, which one is that? Uh, it's ESI plus 80 bytes, say, for example, but it, it could also be like uh, EAX plus uh, whatever this, 172 bytes, uh, or possibly EBX plus four bytes, uh, and so on, if, if you're uh, in a hurry and uh, trying to figure out which instructions to look at first. So, uh, from at this point, I, I basically went and started uh, reversing win32k.sys to figure out well, what was actually going on uh, in the code. Uh, so that was the instruction that died, or that was the last call. Uh, this is what it looks like in Ida. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, there's, this, there's a thing, like when you, when you pull this thing up and you look at it, you immediately, you, there's something you'll immediately notice uh, in, the, uh, in the function name list here that uh, the names for all the functions uh, are the, the, um, the exact same ones that are in the, the documentation, like the Microsoft and Apple specification for two type fonts. So it's like, hey, this is an instruction implementation. It, it's, it's a big jump table. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you go and look at it, like this is the not opcode. Um, and uh, you go down this branch and you, it does not or whatever. You go down that branch and it doesn't. Um, you do, do neg here, you go on this branch, you, do you uh, negate whatever that thing is. And otherwise you go down this branch. This is, you know, hey, there was an error generally. As a not equal to and so forth. Uh, this one is multiply. So it does some stuff. And then it goes down this way. And, uh, and it calls this function, which actually does the multiplication, because it's this weird floating point format. It's, so they, they use this weird, um, they don't use a, a standard IEEE floating point. Uh, they have their own special floating point uh, format uh, in true type fonts. It's, um, I'm trying to think, it was something like a 26-bit um, base part and then like, whatever it was, like six bits of exponent or something. Uh, so uh, it's, it's basically 32 bits in actual memory. So uh, you don't actually have to care about that for writing kernel exploit. Here, I'll, I'll explain. So there's this big jump table uh, of all the instructions. Uh, each offset is, each of these offsets is four times the opcode value. So it's, it's it's pretty uh, obvious what this does. Anyway, this is, this is the the, uh, the the virtual machine basically uh, does does the uh, decoding and then calls each of these functions and so forth. Um, yeah, there's like 190 of these. So um, they, they also all take the uh, if you actually look at so the other thing is if you look up uh, so Ida has this if you've ever used Ida before it's got this this really cool feature to say, hey, tell me like everything that, that references this, this memory uh, or whatever. It, it, you can do, uh, essentially, it's give you all the back references to figure out what calls here or what uses this, uh, which is really, really easy, uh, useful for uh, tra tracing things backwards and stuff like that. So this particular D word variable is used by all this stuff, um, like, like all of them. Uh, and this particular one is, is always set to these values here. So there's probably some sort of error code, uh, particularly because this is always used when it goes down the branch. It doesn't actually do the thing the instructions, the opcode's supposed to do. So, uh, so like, like here, for example. Uh, and then 
uh, and so forth. This, this one too is like 200 of those. Uh, whereas if you look, look at some of these other ones, uh, uh, this particular D word only shows up like 11 times. Uh, and it's all in like call, loop call, and, and various looping instructions. So it must have something to do with some sort of loop counter thingy. This one is a uh, jump. Uh, th th this one only shows up in jump instructions, so it must have something to do with maintaining jump state. Uh, the, this particular one only s seems to be used by uh, if-then statements uh, and loops. Uh, so some sort of conditional thing, whatever. Anyway, um, there's there's a couple of symbols they left into the it left in the um, in the, in the uh, public symbols uh, that you can download off of uh, uh, MSDN. Um, what, one of the symbols that was left in was uh, local GS. Uh, so I'm going to speculate that there's probably a global GS somewhere else in here. Um, uh, particularly because there's a function called update global GS, which takes uh, <laughs> takes that that particular G, that particular D word I was pointing out earlier as the argument. So, anyway, uh, several hours pass, and uh, you, you go down the code. You get to there, and then you, you, you go down somewhere somewhere here. Hang on a second. It was, uh, so somewhere down in here, there's got to be a call or a jump that goes to the shell code. Logically, it has to be somewhere in this function. So here's the main loop of the interpreter. Uh, you can see it basically grabs a, uh, um, you know, grabs a byte and then basically looks it up in the function table, uh, takes whatever that value is, multiplies it by four, that's the offset, do, do, do. And then it goes and it uh, runs it on, on one of these branches. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, no, actually, I get, no, it falls through to the, uh, to the other one up here. But anyway, this is the lookup. So, and so on and so on and so forth. So most of reverse engineering is basically just doing this for hours. Uh, it's not actually that hard. It's just a lot of this. Uh, a lot of people ask me if I was like, how do I how do I get started in, in reverse engineering stuff? And I'm like, it, it's not actually that hard, really. It's just a lot of simple stuff. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of, lots of it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the analogy I use is, is like solving a crossword puzzle. Is, is a, a crossword puzzle this big is not too hard. But if you make it a, a like 10,000 columns wide, it doesn't really get any harder. It's just bigger. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, digging through a bunch of do public documentation uh, on stuff. Um, there's, uh, there's some, some um, um, important to know op codes, which are actually used in the exploit. And um, this, this one, uh, uh, this is one of the important ones, because it's, it's basically what's, what's actually used for writing stuff onto memory, uh, into kernel memory. Because uh, it basically, t uh, so, so the internal, I probably should make a slide for this. So the internal, so the universe, if you're a true type font program, your view of the universe is you've got like three, uh, you've got four data structures. Uh, that are available to you. There's the stack, uh, and all of the operators grab their arguments off the stack and put the, ret the results back on the stack. Uh, then there's a storage array where you can, s where if you say, oh, I don't, I want to put this somewhere other than the stack, you say, okay, just stick it in this array at this offset. Uh, and then there's the CVT, which is a control value table array. Uh, which is basically a similar sort of thing, except it's for the actual points that are used for drawing the uh, outline on the font. Uh, and then there was um, one other array, but it, it, uh, it's not, it's another array. It's, uh, I, I, I think it has another specialized use, which I've forgotten now, but it's, uh, you can look at the, the documentation <laughs> for it, I guess. It's on, up on Microsoft's website. So I was saying this is the funny uh, floating point thing right here, which is actually three two bits in reality. But it's, if you're actually trying to draw a font, it'll be this floating point thing. So the, uh, so this is gra global graphic state. Uh, and then there's also this, um, uh, or so the first thing basically points, oh, so here's the three data structures I just told you about. So, th so this first pointer, 
points to the beginning, the bottom of the stack. Every time you put something on the uh, stack, this goes up or down by four. Um, this points to the storage area, which was the put whatever you want in here array. Uh, and then this points to the, goes to the control value table. Um, and uh, which is for you know, the, the points for the outline. Um, if, if you notice, well, I have another slide of points that draws more attention to it, but if you notice this particular value happens to live like right before this one in memory, about, by about four bytes. Here, let me, let me skip ahead a bit. Well, so the other things in here, like this is the number of pixels and the thing. When I, when I did this, triggered this particular crash, uh, I, I, I set the font size to four points because I didn't know if it mattered. Um, and so forth, and then the stuff. Uh, there's a pointer to the shell code, by the way. The, uh, so you go about 134 bytes from here, uh, and there's this, this, uh, this, which is the length of the CVT array. Um, in this particular case, it's, it's uh, 129. Uh, and then there's some other stuff that doesn't really matter. Uh, and then I think that's the end, I think. I'm not entirely certain, but it, I think it is. And then, um, but the thing is, uh, I highlighted this because this, this right here, is the important part. Because this is what actually makes the whole exploit work. So, this is the good part. So, the, uh, the way that the exploit actually works, or the, the way the vulnerability actually works, hang on, <clears throat> is um, you're, you're merging, there's two bitmaps. Because uh, TrueType also supports bitmap bit fonts in addition to outline fonts um, so at the same time. So um, if you've got, you've got two bitmap glyphs and you put them next to each other and there's a, there's a pair of numbers to specify the X and Y offset for, for where to merge them together if you're kerning them. Uh, but there isn't a bounds check on the like the Y value. So you can say, oh, take this second bitmap and uh, merge it on top of this other, the first one um, 500 bytes further back in memory than the end of the buffer. And, uh, but this is, since it's a, um, a graphics addition, uh, bitwise addition type of thing, you can only add bits to memory. You can't take them away. So the person who implemented this they wrote, they chose to write one single bit to memory. It was, and there was this bit right here. They basically, they, they added 128 to one so that this, this array was now 129 bytes long. Um, this was the one bit they chose to overwrite. And if you, what this allows to happen, and I've got a slide, I should probably just go to that slide. So the CVT value, uh, this is, this is, at the time this happens, it's pointing to like right, right before this structure in memory here. Uh, and the length of it is one D word long, originally. Uh, when, when you add, whoops, so when you, when you add 128 to it, this array is now 129 D words long, but it still lives in the same place in front of the global VM state structure. Uh, so th that makes this entire global VM state structure um, appear inside the CPT table, inside of the true type virtual machine, uh, which, which is now accessible from the font program. So uh, I probably should probably move these to the beginning of it. Of the, uh, of the slide deck, but like I said, it's a bit rough. I was, I was just writing this. So uh, the actual bug is in the, uh, if, you, if you do like a patch diff, uh, it's, it's in the uh, you know, get bitmap function for uh, just type eight and type nine bitmaps or something. Anyway, um, it, it basically takes, takes a, uh, like a number of rows and a Y offset for the, the merging and then pours them together. And it's, it's basically what I just told you a minute ago. Uh, the actual, this is the actual vulnerable code right here. This, this value comes from the tree type font. And then this value, which is your write, where you're writing this value to, also comes from the font. Um, and so you, you can, essentially you can control a, uh, a memory write 
to an arbitrary location. Uh, so, like I said, they, they decided, whoever did this decided to add 128 to the CVT. Um, and blah, 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 I just said this. So, the, uh, so I think like Microsoft like never touched ever any of the true type code ever. Uh, because looking around online at like, like open source true type stuff, basically no, all of it was written like in 1988. Or, and like last revised in 1993, and like nobody's touched it since. Uh, so uh, I think all, like all of the the structures. I haven't actually looked at all the kernels uh, to, to actually verify this, but I think like all the structures are all the same size, so all the offsets are always the same, uh, and they're all relative. So uh, you only need one offset f to work on all versions of Windows, uh, and since the uh, the kernel already, know, already knows kernel already knows where everything is. Uh, ALSR uh, address space layout randomization doesn't make the slightest bit of difference because the, the exploit doesn't need to know where anything is. Um, uh, so, the, yeah, so um, it probably goes back, I don't know if it goes back to NT3, but uh, it wasn't in the kernel, it's NT4, so at least NT3.5 is not vulnerable uh, in the kernel. <laughs> anyway, I, th I think we established that at the beginning of the, the talk. So. Uh, anyway, so basically, uh, since it's an embedded font, uh, or I mean, since it's actually in the font rendering engine in, in the kernel, uh, the exploit works anywhere you can put a font in Windows. So all Office documents, all PDF documents, all web pages uh, with embedded open type font. Uh, um, it was EOT fonts, actually. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the, this is what's actually being used by uh, the Blackwell exploit kit and so forth these days. Uh, oh, and the other thing is, uh, since it takes place up in the kernel and not in user space, uh, you can escape from user space sandboxes around Office and Adobe Acrobat and stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, when I when I figured this out, I was like, wow, this is a pretty amazing exploit. It, it basically works completely reliably everywhere <laughs> on all versions of Windows. Uh, there's actually a 64-bit version, so this is the 32-bit version. Um, apparently, there's actually actually a, I've only I actually really deeply analyzed the 32-bit version because I didn't realize there was a 64-bit version until um, until I saw the uh, the black hole exploit kit had a 64-bit version, and I haven't actually fully analyzed that one yet either. But it has a different another slightly different font program, and some of the offsets are slightly different. Um, so. Uh, so other stuff. So anyway, one of the first things Kaspersky, Kaspersky, Kaspersky pointed out uh, back when this was big news, and is dead obvious when you look at this thing and look at the strings in this thing, is is uh, there's a bunch. So the names table in the font is where you put the uh, uh, where you put the um, like the copyright information and stuff uh, in the font. And and this particular font, for some reason, claims that uh, its name is Dexter Regular. Uh, copyright 2003 Showtime Inc., which is a, apparently a reference to a television show. Uh, nobody, nobody knows why. <laughs> so, uh, and this is the vulnerable code in context. So, this is the actual where the actual. Uh, there's not a check done by this point. So, basically, this is the. Uh, these are the two values, and this is the multiplication, and so that basically gives you what the offset is. So I think I had some slides for doing the math on here, but I don't know. So anyway, the, uh, this particular font, so it was, I guess, maybe handwritten or something, but it, um, it has just barely, barely the minimum bare necessities needed to actually load and do the exploit, and then a big name table that says it's named Dexter. Uh, but, uh, it only has two glyphs defined in the font. Well, it has six, but there's actually two, two actual ones and then four null ones for some reason. Um, so the, uh, to actually trigger the, because to actually trigger the exploit, you have to, you have to uh, merge two characters together. And so the particular two characters that are defined in this font are a colon and a uh, closed parenthesis. Uh, and in order to trigger the exploit, you have to kern the two characters together in exactly that order. Uh, so it looks it looks like this uh, in a regular font. Uh, 
anyway, oh, and, and so yeah, this is basically, there's nothing here. This is all zeros, zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 zero. The, the tables had to be there, but there's nothing in them. This is all zero, 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 zero. Except that one there, that's not, actually, wait, did I cut and paste this right? Uh, no, yeah, this, wait, no, it's on the next slide. This one, <laughs> okay, so this is the actual, uh, this is actual, the actual memory, a uh, chunk of memory that gets overwritten. So basically it's a, uh, a one pixel by one pixel bitmap. Uh, and the bitmap is uh, basically a, a one on this edge and then zeros in the rest of the byte. Uh, so that's 80 hex. Uh, and then uh, this is the, uh, the x and the y offset. And so uh, if you multiply these values together, uh, you end up, uh, from that, that value basically lets you, gets multiplied by the, uh, the width, which is up there somewhere. Um, and uh, I thought I actually had a slide with the, the number, but it's basically you multiply that times the length plus that, and that's where this, that's where that byte gets ordered on top of. Uh, so, okay, here's the really good part. So, the, um, all right, so this is the global VM state structure. Um, this is pointing to the bottom of the stack. You know, this, this is the slide I had like 50 slides back. Uh, this is the CVT. Um, this, uh, and so forth. The, uh, so in the middle of this is a uh, Boolean value for keeping track of uh, whether, it's, whether it's flipping a, 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 um, a glyph drawing around the y axes or not. Uh, and a, a bunch of these are just like kind of like Booleans and counters and stuff like that. Um, and so if you, if you do the math on this, uh, and there was some reason why I had a slide with this math on it, if I can remember. Uh, it was a, uh, oh yeah, so it was basically the, this offset right here is uh, 90 hex decimal bytes from there, or 90, 94 bytes from there. It's the same thing. Uh, written down numerically, it's, it's basically 25 D words from there to there. So, um, the, uh, oh, I was saying, so I was doing this because you can figure out, oh, so basically you know what that is. You, if, you, if you can figure out that that's 90, then you go back and you look at all your, you go back to IDA, and you look up all your function implementations, and, and you see, okay, which of these moves, uh, does anything with, with 90 is, is one of the uh, offsets. And so uh, this, there's this instruction flip on, uh, which sets ECX, which is, uh, comes in from somewhere else. Uh, presumably points right there. And then it adds 90 hex to it. So it goes right there. And then it says it's a one. So um, if, you, if you actually go and look at the documentation uh, on Apple's website, or no, I think this was like Microsoft stocks. Uh, and you see it's basically, a, there's a Boolean value that this operation, uh, that, that these two operands do. So you can basically go through and figure out, like, you can actually go, figure, go through and figure out what each of these, uh, uh, ver where each of these variables are in the, uh, in the state structure, but I didn't bother doing all that. I, I only figured out this one because it's used by the exploit. So a little bit further past this in memory, uh, it's a pointer, which at the time of the crash was pointing off to the shell code. It was something else originally, but I I'm looking at a memory dump from a dead system here. So after the exploit. So the, um, yeah, see there's the, uh, there's the shell code, uh, which is just crashes the system. So uh, this is useful if, you, if you're like, you know, gonna just, just, if you just need a kernel dump uh, to, to, to do this sort of analysis. So the, uh, this is this pointer, it was, I remember with these slides a year ago, I knew what every one of these things was. I haven't actually given this talk for a while. The, uh, this is another pointer to another structure. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, that's why. So, oh, I think that was the original value. Anyway, so, so the, uh, one of the things, is a weird thing in the documentation, the, uh, okay, single, set single width value. Anyway, so the, um, 
the, uh, the, both the, 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 the true type documentation on, on MSDN and op, on Apple's typographer's website or whatever like that uh, lists the name of this opcode as SSW, uh, but actually in win32k.sys it's labeled uh, LSW, and I, I don't know why, but it's the same opcode. Um, so the, this is the actual code here. And if you look, look down here, hey, there's this thing where it loads, it loads a value uh, 100 bytes past the end of this straight state structure. That, that's, that's the state structure. Uh, and, then it, and it calls it. So um, if, you, if you go and you look 100 bytes past the end, hey, look, that's, that's the pointer to the shell code. Um, this, this value right here, EAX is, EAX is basically pointing to the, to the CVT table. So CVT table plus AC hex uh, is that pointer. It grabs that value and calls it. So, oh yeah, there's a shell code. So <clears throat> just a reminder, there's a shell code. So, the, uh, so, this is, here's, I, so here's actually what the, what the program does. So the first, first two things it does is it, is it pushes some zeros down on its stack. Uh, then, it, then it reads it back. Um, WS is to write to the storage array. So in this particular case, it's writing to location zero, the value num uh, zero. So it's putting a zero in the, in the zeroth pot, spot on there. Ding. Um, and this particular, and uh, if you go and look at one of their, one of their tables in the font, uh, there's 32, uh, 32 entries in this particular array. So. Uh, the only, only three of them are going to be used. So the next thing it does is it flips a bit off. It, it was that symmetry bit. So it, it basically goes and it sets this, uh, the D word at the, or this byte at, at this offset to zero. Then later on it goes and it sets it back to one again. So between, oh yeah, and so that is a reminder that's where that is. So between th that and that, it, um, uh, basically reads uh, whatever it just wrote, stuck in that table, ding, uh, and then it then it reads the first CVT value, which was at the beginning of the uh, the thing right before the structure. See, it, it was zero in this particular case. Uh, it's that one right there. That's the first thing it reads. So it basically loads that back up into the stack, um, and then it. Yeah, that one. And then so then it uh, then it flips the bit, um, and then goes and it reads the next value out of the storage array, or rather the first one back out, um, and and stuff. So so here, Alex, I'll, I'll instead of going through this thing by thing, I'll explain. So basically, it's um, the uh, the value in the uh, storage array is being used as a loop counter. Uh, and it increments it by one each time it goes through this. Um, and then it basically also uses an offset for the um, CVT, and it basically walks down the CVT table one uh, entry at a time, uh, but essentially does it in between a, a pair of these flip on and flip off operations. And so it's basically flipping the bit off, reading the CVT value, flipping the bit on, reading the CVT value again, and then comparing them. If they match, well, then it goes to the, to the next one. And if that one matches, it goes to the next one. But then if there's a difference between when it flips on and flips off, then it knows it's found that bit in memory. Is what it's doing is, uh, so yeah, so it, well, it's basically doing the comparison. So if it, if, it's, if it doesn't match, it goes and it jumps to this. Otherwise, it loops back up to, the, to there. So, or sorry, this is the loop. Okay, it's it's been like a year since I looked at these slides. So the uh, so it, it reads the value. This is the the increment in the uh, the the loop index. So it adds one, makes a copy of it, sticks it back in, so forth. Um, ding. So this is the first time through. This is the next iteration. So now it's a one. Uh, this is a bug, by the way. So. Um, the, uh, the, uh, what this is a, is a boundary check to make sure it doesn't walk off the end of the table, the CVT table, if it doesn't actually find this bit. Uh, and so it it's, should be comparing it against 
um, 80 hex, but whoever wrote this exploit wrote 80 decimal in it, which is 50 hex. Uh, they they uh, they did a, a they mixed up a, a decimal and a and a hex representation of the uh, the loop bound. Uh, and, th and this particular it doesn't actually affect the exploit because the exploit happens before long before it hits the end. Uh, but um, it was an interesting bug I noticed. So the uh, anyway, so just some math. Uh, you can probably look at these slides later or something if they ever get published. Uh, <laughs> and stuff like that to follow along. Or you can just go, go to some black, black hole web, uh, exploit site, like get, get infected with a, the capture of one of the fonts and do the analysis as well. So, uh, oh, so yeah, this is, um, so this is, a, this is an undocumented thing. So the, uh, the, the, um, the jump, uh, is undefined for negative values, but uh, in the way that Microsoft implemented it, it, it actually works okay. So uh, this is what this was. This is, I actually had to go and actually read through the implementation for the jump instruction in the, in the true type VM to make sure that negative values were okay. So um, as according to, the, according to the official documentation, they're not. Well, it's undefined, but uh, I, I didn't know if, it was, if, if negative values would be true or false. So anyway, and I actually forgot the answer now, but it's, it's, it's somewhat, somewhere in here. The, the answer's in there. So, the, uh, so basically, it goes to the loop again and does this stuff. Anyway, so it, it uh, doo -doo -doo. and so blah, blah, blah. You go along, and eventually you get to there. Uh, so what I was saying, so it's basically walking along, do, 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 do. And then it gets to here, and then this bit goes from 0 to 1, and then 1 to 0, and so forth. And it says, aha, I know where I am now. I'm 90 bytes past the end of this thing or 25 loops through. So basically, when the, when the, iterator, when the uh, array index reaches 25 hex, uh, whatever, 37 or whatever, the, uh, which is what these two things are here, uh, then it jumps into this chunk of code right here. And it uh, uh, basically goes and it grabs a value, uh, whatever this was, four bytes past the end of 26, where it just was, and then it sticks it back down on top of um, the CVT value three bytes after that. So basically, it takes the, that value, which points to the beginning of the font program, way, way over back in the, in, the font, in the font file. It's the, this where the shellcode was living, was in the other font program. Remember, was, remember that dummy font program I, I was going on about at the beginning that was just a no-op that didn't do anything? All right, so basically 50 bytes after that was the actual beginning of the shellcode. Uh, this is basically the address, points to the beginning of that dummy program. Uh, and so 50 bytes on to, uh, in addition to that is basically the, the, where the shellcode is. So it, it, uh, that's where the flip on and off, flip off thing is. It grabs that value, which is the pointer to the font program, and then um, adds 50 to it, basically, sticks it back on top of memory. And then uh, let me go through the, I'm almost to the end. Um, writes it there on top of the function pointer to the rounding function. So um, the so basically it takes so that that's basically the address for the, uh, for the shellcode of memory, and then it calls yeah the plus fifty, and then it basically calls the uh, remember this dummy program yes that one. That dummy program. So there's a dummy program, and then there's a shell code, 50 by, uh, 80 bytes after it. So, you, so then, when it, once it's copied that there, it, it calls the SSW op code, which goes and it reads this function pointer. Okay, so so the way that uh, the way that the the virtual machine in Windows is implemented, the um, uh, there's like say like there's like six different rounding operators for uh, or rounding modes for true type fonts, and the way that Microsoft implemented this was they actually had six f actual functions. Uh, and when you set when you do the opcode to set the rounding mode, it changes a function pointer for the round operation to one of these six 
Uh, the, so this, uh, this SSW instruction is another one of those where it's basically a function pointer to which of the several implementations of this opcode are actually going to be used right now for this current state. So when it calls it, uh, so when you, when you call this operation, it goes um, and it, hang on, it, uh, it's not that. Okay, good. So then it goes, it go, remember in here, it goes, it grabs the, that function pointer and then jumps to it, uh, calls it basically. And, in this, and since, since that value was now, is now pointing to the shell code, when it goes to execute this instruction, the implementation for it is now the shell code. And ta-da, you do the math and uh, it, that writes that there and then that does that and then poof. Ta-da. Okay. <laughs> this is it. Ta-da. So at that point, at that point, you're basically running the shell code. <laughs> All right. I'm, a, I'm about out of time. I, time. I, I think I have like a couple seconds left. <laughs> Actually, I've got 40 seconds left. 40 seconds. Okay. Good. I, I was worried I'd, I might come in a little bit over or under. <laughs> so you made it perfect on time. What? You made it perfect on time. Okay. Excellent. All right. Huge applause. Probably. Um, so, also, if anybody has any questions, I think there's microphones, how it's done. Uh, also, in two hours, I'm giving another talk uh, in the same room, uh, which I, I should also hopefully have finished being written by then. Uh, but, No questions. Um, I was wondering, since Microsoft decided on shorthand to move quite a lot of the graphical stuff to the user space in Vista just to move it back to the kernel in Windows 7, uh, if Windows Vista might actually be the only current system that's not vulnerable to this. I actually don't know. <laughs> I haven't actually done a full compatibility test on this. I, 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 think, I, I, think, I, test, I think I did this analysis like an old XP box because it was <laughs> easy. And I had, a one laying, I had a VM laying around. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, remember, I remember there was a, there was a blog I saw where somebody tested out which patch levels uh, that Windows and or IE had to be at in order to be vulnerable to this, because uh, it was on the it was the, on the initial um, the p a public uh, discovery that uh, Black Hole, you know, Cool Exploit Kid had been using this. It was it was like caffeine, caffeine's blog or something like that. It was like malware malware don't need coffee. I think was a blog blog spot. I think was the uh, the blog. The um, um, they, uh, uh, whoever writes this blog basically went and installed like back all the different uh, like knowledge base, base patch level ch uh, changes for, for Windows to figure out exactly which ones were vulnerable and which ones weren't. And there's a graph <laughs> on that blog if you go look. And it, it might have a clue about whether or not Vista is uh, okay. vulnerable Thanks. or not. But I haven't actually tested that myself. All right. Thank you very much for the talk. I have to close this now. Okay. So give a warm applause to the speaker.